So our message today uh, comes from a scripture in Job, which we'll get to soon. The title, Hey God, What About My Checkbook? And when we talk about this subject, uh, I can't help but think, my mind always turns back to the year 2008. 2008 was interesting because some of you might remember uh, we went through quite the financial crisis. Okay, They called it the mortgage crisis. And many of us will remember that businesses were kind of closing across the nation at an alarming rate and employees were being laid off and people used to be able to pay their mortgages one week and then the next week or the next month all of a sudden they couldn't do it. And so there was kind of this weird feeling that went across through the nation. And as of now, that was 10, 11 years ago, as of now, some sources are still quoting the American jobless rate at close to 10%. So even if some of us have a job, we might be nervous. If you don't have a job, chances are you've probably been job hunting for 6 to 12 months at least. And I think it's safe to say that what happened back then is still lingering in some of our consciousness today, and it causes this kind of culture of fear. Fear of financial loss, fear of maybe losing our 401k retirement, fear of instability in general. With the presidential election fast approaching, of course, will we look to our new leaders for guidance? Will we blame them if something doesn't work? And the fact is, a lot of improvement has occurred since 2008, but there's still a lot of room for more improvement. And many folks have retained this level of anxiety because of this event. We recently finished up with the tax deadline for 2018, as some of you know, and as I drove over to my accountant's office to pick up my return and, and look at it, I'm using return uh, in quotes, uh, I used to think back fondly to the days when I would receive a refund. Typically, this isn't the case anymore. Uh, kids are growing up. We don't spend as much money at daycare, uh, and, and Uncle Sam is taking a notice. Okay, So I kind of cringe every time I look and see uh, what I owe them, because I usually owe them now. And so nothing sets the stage for an un uncertain future, kind of like worrying about dollar signs. Will there be enough? What will I do if there isn't? And so during this time, it is normal to ask, where is God in all of this? Are we simply a product of our economy, bound by the ebb and flow of these economic lulls and recessions? Is God out to lunch? Is he watching? Or does he even care? And as I've been thinking about these questions, a few things come to mind. Once again, the Bible provides insight for us here. And so if we examine for a minute what we really lose versus what we gain when our environment forces us to tighten the belt a bit sometimes. And I want to start off by saying uh, I am not forgetting about people who lost their homes, lost their retirements, can't afford to eat. For, for that stuff, there's no easy answer. There's no quick fix. But I want to talk for a minute about some of the things that relative wealth in America is still a wealthy nation, allows us to do. When our materialistic needs are being met, I think we have a tendency to kind of become isolated or cocooned. I'll explain that. So if I have enough money to get the groceries I need, take my family on summer vacation, make a mortgage payment, and keep up on some of life's more enjoyable activities, it occurs to me to ask, what spiritual purpose am I fulfilling? Yes, I can contribute money here and there. That's the good part. But what is happening to my spiritual side? Might I not become more or less a little bit even apathetic when it comes to this relative comfort? Do I think about the day-to-day -day evils of poverty if I'm not experiencing it, if I'm not seeing it? Or for that matter, do I realize that I still need other people at all? Do I need God? Or worse yet, do I start to think to myself in a judgmental fashion, boy, those people over there are struggling financially. They must be doing something wrong. Right? Those people. So tempting to think that way. And so if I can live on my own little island and everything is comfortably provided, 
then what do I have to seek out the rest of the world for? I can simply buy, continue buying television sets, new cars, upgrading my cell phone each year, and maybe if I wanted to, I wouldn't have to talk to anyone face to face at all. I would just continue living out my life on my island. I'm exaggerating, but you get the idea. But what about when the financial current is rattled and I get laid off, or my spouse gets laid off? All of a sudden, I can't make that mortgage payment as easily. What if I suddenly become one of those people myself? And so having been in situations similar to this in the past and watching others struggle, I can tell you I think we usually react in one of two ways. The first way is that I can hoard everything I have left, I can panic, I can become depressed or angry. Angry at God, angry at everyone around me, especially those who seem to have plenty. I may even stop giving altogether. The other option is to see this as an opportunity to possibly live the way God wants us to live, needing and depending on each other to get by, helping each other from day to day. To redirect that thinking that sneaks in which says, you take care of you and I'll take care of me, and to step out from behind that bubble or that cell phone and back into the real world, we must come outside of that comfort zone every once in a while. We must leave our island and begin to wade through the deep water in the ocean around us. There is plenty of me out there. And so when we talk about financial stewardship and giving in the church, I think this cultural fear can influence what and how we give. And if we look at the Old Testament, of course, books from the Bible like Leviticus tell us to tithe and give a tenth of our income to God. And if you're doing that, right on. That's awesome, man. And so, but what does the New Testament say on giving? If we look at scriptures like 2 Corinthians 9 and 7, here's what it says. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Cheerful giver. We can't wait to bring our offering because we are so loved by God and by the church that it makes sense to give. It feels natural, not like it does to make a car payment. And so I just want to encourage everyone who calls Drakesville Church their home to give joyfully in accordance with what you have decided in your heart. Because financial giving is actually a spiritual thing. Did you know that? Often, if churches aren't giving, it's a love problem, not a money problem. And in those times of difficulty, when things get hard and making ends meet is more difficult, should we still give? Do we get a pass on that? So in times of trouble, God's people should not become bitter, which is easier said than done, of course. Um, and though Job was subjected to severe circumstances in the Old Testament, he never rejected or renounced his creator. We remember what happened to poor Job. The devil made a pact with God to affect Job's life. God said, do what you will to my servant, just don't take his life. And so Job ends up with boils and sores across his body. He loses his home. He loses his livestock. He loses members of his family. And so if anyone can make the next statement, Job has a right to do so, I think. This is what he said. It's a famous one. You'll recognize it. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's Job 1, 21. Blessed is the name of the Lord. We take what comes our way, folks, both the good and the bad. And I don't think God was punishing America in 2008, but if it was a judgment, we may in fact have needed it. What does a country get when it sets itself up as its own creator, when we become too financially comfortable, when we are shown that our wealth is transitory? I think often we come face to face with the real self, for better and worse. 
Are we more like John the Baptist or the rich young ruler? And we remember what happened between the rich young ruler and Jesus. The rich young ruler, one of these guys who was kind of arrogant, a little bit cocky, uh, he sees Jesus out in public, he walks up to him, he says, Lord, what do I do to gain eternal life? And the rich young ruler is banking on the fact that Jesus will say, follow the Ten Commandments, and you shall have life, and that is what Jesus says at first. And I picture this smile coming across his face as he says, yes, I've done all those things. But then Jesus says something else, and I love this picture. It's uh, that he's rubbing his forehead. That's kind of what we do whenever Jesus asks us to give up something, I think. So he's got the forehead rubbing going on. And this is what Mark 10, 21 to 22 says. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Now, it's hard to say what happened next, strictly speaking. We don't know, but I have a feeling he did not go home and sell all that he had. His heart would not allow him to sacrifice in that way. Jesus knew it was not a wealth problem. Money was not the issue there. It was the way he viewed money. It was a heart problem. Jesus knew it. Jesus called him out. We are not to love money, church. We are to love God and each other. Giving is a spiritual thing, not a checkbook thing. I grew up with someone, actually, um, and this was the type of guy who, if he had one dollar, he could turn it into two dollars. He was just gifted in that arena, which was awesome. Awesome to watch. Um, uh, and as time went by, though, and, and he went from um, kid to teenager to man, and he began to progress, and, and his wealth began to progress, there's one of two ways you can go. Uh, is he like John the Baptist, or is he like the rich young ruler? And I can see things starting to change for him. And eventually he had the big house, the mansion, um, and he had these fancy cars in the driveway. And then when I, when I would go over to visit at the house, it was really neat. Uh, and we'd walk around inside, but we weren't allowed to touch anything. Um, and there, there were no velvet ropes closing off parts of the house, but you had that feeling, okay? And so uh, we, you weren't allowed to put your feet on the hassock or, or a glass of water on the end table. And uh, the furniture was the aisle. And, and the house was the church, and it was just it was just nuts. And I remember thinking about the rich young ruler every time I was there. Now, trust me, friends, I would rather go out and buy TVs also and not think about this stuff, and it's easier and more fun to do that, and shopping therapy is fun. And don't even get me started on buying things just to keep up with other people. That is crazy. It's a rat race. If you're on that hamster wheel, get off of it. Don't compare yourself to what others have. Just own what you have and be grateful for it. And so I mentioned John the Baptist earlier. Now, this is interesting. Why would I bring his name up in contrast to the rich young ruler? So the rich young ruler is on this end of the spectrum. We got John the Baptist on the other end of the spectrum. What do we remember about John the Baptist? He was the one out in the wilderness waiting for Jesus to come to him. Jesus finally comes to him one day, says, you need to baptize me. John says, no, you're in charge, not me. It needs to be the reverse. He ends up baptizing Jesus anyway to fulfill prophecy. In Matthew 3, 4 to 5 says this. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan to see this simple man. No fine dining for him. No ribeye steaks and glasses of wine on Friday nights. He ate simple food. He wore simple clothes. Can you picture him going to a department store and buying expensive leather shoes and handbags and hip clothing and all that stuff? No, not a chance. His heart was in a different spot. Now these things, this stuff, these possessions aren't bad in and of themselves. They are neutral. Money is neutral. But John's heart was pure. He was the opposite of the rich young ruler in that way. He got it. He understood it. 
Now, friends, my family is by no means isolated from this kind of trend of economic recession anxiety. But I'm hoping that we come out of it with the lesson learned and not the fear. That I remember money is a tool, but only God is worth trusting and worshiping. That it is okay to need other people from time to time and to ask for help when it's appropriate because that is so difficult, is it not, to ask for help. And that if someone asks us for help, we don't look at them as one of those people because those people were also Jesus' people. He ate with them, he talked with them, tax collectors, sinners, people who struggle, people who are outcasts on the fringe of society. And we remember to give as the Lord has blessed to the church and to do so joyfully, obediently, and with love. Because at the end of the day, there will be enough left over for ourselves as well. Would you pray with me? Father God, we, we thank you so much for this difficult teaching, for the guidelines handed down to us in the Bible. We pray that as we study them and we unpack them, that we have a fullness in the way we understand it. And that when it comes to giving and, and it comes to our money, we look not to trust in that, but rather to trust in you. And we give back to you joyfully <coughs> with love. And we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.